I want to talk to you today. Uh, I've noticed since Thanksgiving, and it happens every year, right around the Thanksgiving time, all of the sermons that people give from Thanksgiving up until Christmas, they focus on the love of Jesus, they focus on the life of Jesus, they focus on the birth of Jesus, and I've heard a lot of them these last couple of weeks, uh, weeks. and they've been very good ones, they've been very good ones. But what I realized um, while I was listening to these sermons is they talk about the love and they talk about the grace of God, but one of the things they're not talking about is why they chose God in the first place, why they chose to follow Jesus in the first place. Um, because it's a, personal, it's a personal journey that you go on when you're with Christ. And so what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about my journey. I want to talk about to you where I started, where I am, how I got here, um, because it was a big, big deal to me when it finally dawned on me how much I mean to Christ. Not so much what he means to me, but how much I mean to Christ, just like all of you do. Every one of us has a special place, and uh, that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, so before we start, let's, let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we ask you please to be with us during this service, and we pray, Lord, that what we do is well in your sight. Lord, please let my words be yours. Please let the Holy Spirit take over and guide me in everything I say. I pray these things in your name, Lord. Amen. So what I want to do <clears throat> is I want to read you a little story that I found, and I think it's a great story. Um, it's a story that I, I stumbled across when I was looking things up online, and it goes right to with what I want to speak about today. <clears throat> Excuse me. The name of it is, He Said Just Pedal. I used to think God, as an observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there sort of like a president. I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I didn't really know him. But later on, when I met Jesus, it seemed as though life were rather like a bike, but it was a tandem bike, and I noticed that Jesus was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know just when it was he suggested we change places, but life has not been the same since I took the backseat to Jesus, my Lord. Jesus makes life exciting. When I had control, I thought I knew the way, but it was rather boring, but predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. But when he took the lead, he knew delightful long cuts up mountains and through rocky places at breakneck speeds. It was all I could do to hang on. Even though it often looked like madness, he said, pedal. I was worried and anxious, and he asked, what are you, where are you taking, and I asked, where are you taking me? He laughed and didn't answer, and he started to, and I started to learn to trust. I forgot my boring life and entered the adventure, and when I'd say I'm scared, he leaned back and touched my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing, acceptance, and joy. They gave me their gifts to take on my journey, our journey, my Lord's and mine, and we were off again. He'd say, give the gifts away, their extra baggage, too much weight, so I did to the people we met, and I found out that giving I received, and still our burden was light. I did not trust him at first in control of my life. <clears throat> I thought he'd wreck it, but he knows bike secrets. He knows how to make them bend around sharp corners, jump to clear high rocks, and fly to short, scary passages. I'm learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places, and I'm beginning to enjoy the view in the cool breeze on my face, with my delightful, constant companion, Jesus. And when I'm sure I just can't do anymore, he smiles and says, pedal. I found that uh, story and I, I realized that's kind of like everybody's walk is, right? We start off not trusting, we start off not sure what's going on, but as we trust, as we learn, things become more exciting and it's not as burdensome as we first started out. I grew up in a house, um, my mother was Catholic, she studied and became a Seventh-day Adventist before she passed away. Uh, and I had the honor of teaching her the Bible before she got baptized, which is very cool. But when I grew up in our house, my mother would always tell you there is a God. There was no doubt in her mind God existed. But we never talked about Jesus. And it's not that she didn't believe in the Son, it's just it was always about God. We never talked about the things that Christ had done for us. 
And it actually impacts me to this day because a lot of times when I'm referring to things, I refer to God the Father before I refer to God the Son, which is important because it was God the Son who died on the cross for me, not God the Father. The important relationship between God the Son, to me, takes a front seat to what I should be understanding and what I should be learning. So around Christmas time, just like everybody else, um, we had our traditions, you know, and we, like I said, we celebrate right now, we're celebrating the birth of Christ and all that, but in our house, although we knew this was the birth of Christ, um, it's not what we celebrated. We celebrated things like, you know, getting together as a family, we had our Christmas dinner, um, it was more about the Christmas tree, the gifts, Santa Claus, things like that, it wasn't really about Christ. And every year, with our traditions, like everybody else, things went along. Christ was never there, but our traditions went on. Like one of our traditions, one of our traditions was every year my mother and father, um, they would put our stockings on our bed, at the foot of our bed. That was the only thing we were allowed to open because we had to wait for our parents to get up in the morning. And of course, as young kids, we were up at four or five o'clock in the morning ready to go, and they weren't. And every year in those stockings upstairs, um, my brothers and I, we would all get, I don't know if you guys remember what they were, they're called SSPs. Does anybody remember who that was? Those were those big, heavy plastic cars that had the big wheel in the middle, and you stuck the thing in, you pulled it and put it down, it would take off. We got those every year. And in the house I grew up in, when you went upstairs to our bedrooms, the wall that ran on the right-hand side, that was the wall to my mother and father's bedroom. And at the foot of the stairs was the front door. And my mother and father's bed was against that. So every year, what my brothers and I did was we built a little ramp and fired our SSPs down the stairs. The idea was to wake mom and dad up. It usually took about two tries. Um, and once they got up, you know, first you'd hear my mother scream, knock it off. We knew, okay, we're ready. We're starting to get going now. You know, that, that, was a that was a tradition in our house. You ask my brothers about SSPs now, and they'll start laughing. and They'll tell you all the exact same stuff I just told you. So one of the other things that would happen is once we got downstairs, my father was the one who always passed out the gifts. He would lay under the tree. He and my mother would point which one she wanted given out first, and he'd give them to us. But before we could even get to that, my mother had to make him a cup of coffee. And every time he made the coffee, every Christmas, he accidentally spilled a little, so we had to wait a little while while it was cleaned up. This, again, drew traditions. They may not be what everybody else does, but that's what happened in our house every Christmas morning. And so as things went along, though, and as times changed, our needs as kids changed, you know, our needs, our wants, the things we want. And for you kids out there listening, there's going to be a day that the toys stop and it's just clothes. <laughs> it's a terrible Christmas, that first Christmas. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> but anyways, there was one Christmas my brother, my oldest brother, decided he didn't want gifts. All he wanted was the dollar amount equivalent to whatever my parents were going to spend. He did not want gifts, he wanted the cash. So what my mother and father did was they got a little creative in how they were doing, like one of the, <laughs> one of the things they did was they took $50 in nickels and wrapped it up in a box and gave it to him. So he had to take all the nickels out, roll them, bring them to the bank, count them. And I can tell you right now, it was not the same Christmas that year as it was normally because when he found out at the end of the day, the cash isn't what it's all about. It's about the gifts and having the fun and everything. And every once in a while on occasions, we would go to um, the Catholic Church. Again, like I said, I grew up Catholic. And what we would do is we'd go to the Christmas Mass. And all that was to me, I can tell you as a child, the only thing that was to me was a one-hour Mass. Hurry up and get home. I want to go back and play with my toys. That's all it was. We still weren't talking about God. He was real. But he wasn't something that was in the center of our home. He wasn't something that we strove to be part of. And I can tell you, um, if you told my mother there wasn't a God, whatever was closest to it was going to come hurling towards your head. You know, so it was, it, it, so like I said, she more beat it into us instead of taught it what, it what it was supposed to be about. Well, that's okay. That's all right. So like I told you before, when I was growing up playing football, my prayer life was only doing the Lord's Prayer, saying the Lord's Prayer just before every game. We'd get together as a team, we'd say the Lord's Prayer, and play the game. And when I first came into the church and started coming to church on a regular basis, when the Lord's Prayer was said, while well, everybody else was praying, what was running through my mind was different games I had played in in high school. I wasn't thinking about what was going on when I first started coming to church, but what I realized 
as time went on, I realized that the Lord's Prayer has so much more meaning. And I can promise you this, when the Lord's Prayer said, now football is the furthest thing from my mind. That's just something that's grown with me as I've grown as a Christian. And during, the, uh, during this time, like the story, like I told you, God was nothing but a, jed, a judge, someone to decide whether I was going to heaven or hell. You gotta understand, growing up in that environment, hell was a real thing. And it's always amazed me how you can find a lot of pictures depicting hell. Very graphic pictures that can really scare a kid, but you don't find a lot of pictures depicting heaven. You know, everybody, it's, everybody can let their imaginations run wild with hell, but not heaven for whatever reason. And it was such a relief to me to know that one, hell is not what people think it is. And two, it doesn't matter how bad I am, I'm saved by grace at the end of the day. It has nothing to do with I, whether I'm up here talking with you, whether I do Bible studies, none of that counts. We're always saved, we're only saved by the grace of God and nothing else. <clears throat> the only thing I knew about the, the Jesus part of it, believe it or not, was it came from the cartoon, The Charlie Brown Christmas. When Linus recited this to Charlie Brown every year, he would say, um, that's what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. And he would say, now they're in the same country, shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which will be with all people. For there is, a born, there is born to you on this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel of multitude and a heavenly host praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and goodwill and peace to earth and goodwill to men. I never knew that was from the Bible, let alone the book of Luke. I thought that was just part of the script from the Peanuts, from the Peanuts cartoon, because that's all I knew. I didn't know. We weren't taught about Jesus. We weren't taught about the love of Jesus. And the text means so much more to me. Can you imagine being one of those shepherds standing in the field when those angels came and showed themselves and told you what was going on? Now, instead of thinking of a cartoon, what runs through my mind is, man, I wish I was there. That would have been incredible to see firsthand. <clears throat> so you gotta understand that my walk with Christ really didn't start till I was in my mid-30s, well, my early 30s, actually. Um, that's when I found my tandem bike. Through my 20s, things like that, it wasn't part of my life. It wasn't who I was. It wasn't something that I wanted to be part of. Well, actually, it was more of that that I didn't want to be part of it. I just didn't give it any thought. And it all happened by accident. I've told you guys a story before. I've told this a few times, how my brother joined a cult, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I needed to find out about it. So I started researching the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I've told you about how, you know, my brother, the way he did it, it wasn't, it turned me off to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So the first thing I did is I went to priests and asked them about it. And what I didn't know now, didn't know then that I know now, is that was Jesus introducing himself to me. It was not about my brother joining the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was about Jesus finally saying to me, well, he had been saying all along, but me finally recognizing, here I am. Let's try doing this together. And just like in the story, I took the front seat first, right? Just like we always do. And <clears throat> I don't know about any of you, but when I first started following Christ, I felt as though I understood more I chalked a lot of things up to coincidence, and I was always in the front seat, never relinquishing the back. We swipe every once in a while, um, but the reality was is I felt as though that yes, he's there now, but I'm in charge, and we'll just do things my way because I know best. And Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Well, you talk about not understanding. When you think you understand, that's when you understand the least, and this is the things I was learning as I started to get more and more involved. And I still take the front seat occasionally, but I ask, it's short-lived, and there are far and few days between me when I do that. 
I've learned a lot of lessons over the years, and my lessons are I am way better in the back seats. More gets done, more happens when I sit in the back and not in the front. My real path with Christ started when I got married, <laughs> and that's when things started to unfold for me. There was a path in front of me. It was an overgrown path. It certainly wasn't a cut-down path by any means. It wasn't clean, but there was a now a path in front of me when we first got married. And I'll tell you what, I am very blessed in the fact of the family I married into because my wife's family taught me an awful lot in the very beginning. There was a lot of things I didn't know that they showed me and taught me. One of the things that we had going on at the time is we were having um, a problem with one of our children at the time. So we weren't coming to church. It was weeks on end we wouldn't come to church. We could go over a month and not show up at church. Um, we weren't involved. We weren't doing anything. We were actually, we were one of those ch uh, families that was on the books only. And, you know, and my wife and I knew better. We were both baptized. We both had studied to get where we were. But we shoved all that aside. We stopped coming. We focused on what was going on with our child. But the reality is we could have done both. But we didn't. You know, and what I, what I look back on it now I was actually a roadblock to my other children who were trying to find Christ. I was the one blocking them away from that. I was the one not letting them to Christ. And we had some young kids at the time. If you want to look into the eyes of Christ, really look into the eyes of Christ, look into a child's eyes when they say, can we go to church, and you tell them, no, not today. You see the same disappointment in their eyes that Christ has for us when we decide Church isn't what we're doing. We're going to do something different because at that point, we're not only getting, we're only not getting on the bike. We're not even asking Christ to get in the back seat anymore. We're just taking off on our own. And I really believe that when we do stuff like that, we hurt our, uh, we hurt God's failings. We hurt Jesus's failings. And one of the regrets I have is during that time, the child that was having a problem asked if he could be baptized, and I fell into that pattern of, "You're not old enough. You have to wait." Of our five children, he is the only one not baptized. I stopped that. Nobody else. I stopped that because of my ignorance and not being close to Christ like I should have been. This is all part of the walk. I pray for him. I do. But um, his not being baptized is something I'm going to have to answer for when I get to heaven. It's the way it is. And um, you try to learn from it. I have four other children that are all baptized. Uh, but, you know, it's like the, the sheep, right? The one missing one, you go searching, but sometimes you don't find the sheep. Um, you also remember in the story that it talked about how Jesus puts people in our lives to give us gifts and show us the way, shows us compassion, shows us uh, love. I've had a lot of people in this church that's done that for me. I've had a lot of people show me a lot of love. And if I sat up here and gave you the entire list, we'd be here all afternoon. I mean, it's a laundry list. But right now, off the top of my head, I can tell you that the elders that I serve with are fantastic people and have a huge impact in my life. I am blessed to be able to call Suzanne Young and Shaman Dennis good friends of mine. These are people that have a huge impact on my life. But there are two other men in this church that have really shaped who I am and really helped me um, become a good person. One of those people is Mike Brown. You remember Mike. Mike Brown was the kindest, gentlest man I've ever met. He taught me how to be gentle. He taught me how to be kind. And I got to tell you, all the years I knew Mike, I don't think there was ever a time I didn't see a smile on his face. And the other person is Ralph Diller. Ralph has taught me integrity. Ralph has taught me to stand up for what's right, regardless of what anybody says. Ralph has taught me how to stand my ground and do what's right. And what my favorite thing about all this with both of these men, they're not just elders that I've served with. Now they're friends of mine. They're people that I consider very close friends of mine. And that, to me, is more important than any position I can ever hold in this church. But there was another person, and you'll remember who she is, who came at, came at me out of the blue one day when we were going through all these problems with our child, our son. It was Eleanor Brown. Eleanor came up to me one day and said to me, Jeff, would you consider teaching down in the um, primary Sabbath school every other week? I don't know why she asked me. It wasn't like we were close. 
Uh, I knew nothing about Eleanor, but she came up to me, she asked me, and I said yes, which meant now my wife and I were at least coming to church half the time, because we had a commitment. Well, I gotta tell you, that was 18 years ago when I'm still downstairs in the primary Sabbath school. I don't know what she knew, but whatever she knew, it's, it certainly blessed me. And for those of you who think Sabbath school's not important, Sabbath school brought me back to church, Sabbath school brought me closer to Christ, and I, I believe Sabbath school saved me spiritually. And I learned so much downstairs. Again, people in my life, all of these little people who come into my life, oh my goodness, they absolutely blow me away with the things that they teach me every day. They are such a blessing to be part of. I'm so grateful that I'm down there. So after doing this for about four years, I was about four years into it, what happened was is I was tapped on the shoulder for the first time to be on the nominating committee. To me, that was a pretty big deal. You know, I'd never been on a nominating committee before. Um, I never knew what was involved, but when I did it, you know, I became part of it. You gotta understand, going back to the story, I was still in the front seat. Although, um, although I was you know, coming to church more regularly and I was more involved, I was still driving and I was not let Christ leading at the time. Um, there was still a lot of holes in my relationship with Christ because I was still not paying tithe on a regular basis. I was still not doing the things that I needed to do. And when I did pay tithes, it was very grudgingly. It was just 10%. That's all the Bible asked for. I'm not giving you another dime. You don't need anything else besides that. That's where I was at the time. And then Eleanor again, along with Mike and Warren Clark, approached me and asked me if I would consider being an elder in the church. I did not think I was the right person at the time. I did not think I had the skill set. I did not think um, I had the leadership ability to do it. Joshua 1.9, it says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. And this is something I started, to need, I started needing to remember. I started to re had needed to understand that whatever I was being called to do, if I accepted it, he wasn't going to leave me on my own to do it. He was going to be with me the entire time. Uh, I was getting more involved. I was starting to understand more. Like I said, we were struggling doing things like paying tithes and things like that, but we did what we needed to do. And what ended up happening was, it was the village church members who helped me grow as an elder. You see, when you're asked to be an elder, one of the things that you're just responsible for is the spiritual growth of your church. But I'm telling you right now, it was all of you who helped me grow spiritually. Those are the kids downstairs who helped me grow spiritually. One of the church members was telling me a story about how she needed gas and she was stuck and literally a $20 bill floated down from the sky and she was able to use that for gas money and get where she wanted to go. Another church member told me the story about when he was baptized. He was baptized in Camp Winnipeg, and he told the story about while he was standing there looking around, he saw all the little fish like in a little circle as witnesses to his baptism. And he got very, very emotional about that because it brought him to a very special place. And what I got started thinking is, I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be, have those feelings that everybody else was having. The things you were sharing with me, I wanted to be part of. And I wasn't having, at the time, I wasn't having those intimate parts, those intimate conversations, those intimate relationships with Christ. And it was bothering me. Here I am, an elder in the church, and I'm still not hearing or getting the same miracles everybody else was. I would pray to Christ, and I would ask Christ all the time, please tell me what you want. I do not read between the lines. You have got to be blunt and upfront with me because I am, do not have the skill set to figure out what's going on. That is not who I am. It was easy for me to take the things I was seeing around me and putting them in my mind and making it into situations where I'm like, okay, this is what he obviously wants, but those were the situations of how I wanted them to go. So I wasn't really listening. I wasn't paying attention. I was still letting me make the decisions as opposed to what was really going on. And you can ask Suzanne, you can ask my wife. I can't tell you how many times I'd go to them and say, you know what? I don't think I should be an elder anymore. 
I'm going to step down. I don't think I have what it takes. And finally, one day, my wife, I said, you know what? She goes, I know. You don't think you should be an elder anymore? You want to step down? Then fine, step down and get it over with. I had beaten that horse to death. You know, I still have doubts once in a while. But just like in the story, and I don't know when this happened, and I wish I could tell you because, I honestly, I gave it a lot of thought. One day, Christ took the front seat and never got out of it. I wish I could remember that epiphany. I don't. I just know that one day things started making sense to me. I realized that Christ was answering my questions the entire time. He never walked away and didn't answer the question. The problem was is I wasn't listening. Those lines that I told you I don't read between, the only lines that were being put up were the lines that I was putting up. I made it more difficult than it needed to be. I made it hard to communicate him with him. He wasn't making it hard to communicate with me. Hebrews 13, 11 says, I mean, I'm sorry, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, Christ never changed. I did. He was always doing the exact same thing, but it was me who was playing catch up the whole time because I thought I should be in charge. I thought I should be leading. I didn't give up the front seat until that day that it all happened to me. I realized that it had been him guiding me the whole time. He was the one putting the right people in my path. He was the one challenging me to do more for his people. He was the one who had confidence in me that I didn't have in myself. Today's scripture reading is 1 John 4, 10. It says, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He sent his son to be our propitiation for our sins. He sent his son down to do the things that we can't do for ourselves. And I'm at a point in my life now where I know what it means to nail at the foot of the cross. I know what it means. As Jesus hung on that cross with his hands and feet nailed, a a, a crown of thorns on his head, a hole in his side, what did he do? He looked up and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his remnant and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. And when the rulers also with them derided him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. What they didn't understand and what I understand now is he didn't come to save himself. He came to save us. Jesus was hanging on the cross. And as he was up there, me, you, Everybody in this church, everybody at home watching, everybody who's ever taken a breath that Christ has provided ran through Jesus' mind. We were all on his mind the day that he hung on that cross. And we all took part in putting him up there. But even though all that was going on and as bad as it was, his only thought was his love for us and asked his father to forgive us. As long as Christ was alive and walking on this earth, His only thought, his only purpose was to love us, take care of us, and teach us. It took me time to understand what I mean to Jesus, what we all mean to Jesus. And what I realized over the time is um, he means more to me than I can put into words. And I'm telling you, I actually tried to do that. For this, for this message, I actually sat down and said, okay, how can I describe what Christ means to me? And nothing came to me. And the reason nothing came to me is there is not a vocabulary that can describe how much he's done for me personally, how much he loves me, how much he wants what's good for me. And, and when I say me, I'm talking about you as well. It's not just me. It's every single person. If you're struggling, I promise you the foot of the cross is where you want to be. If you're having a hard time, stop and listen. And he will answer your questions. You know, one of the things that's always driven me crazy was when people talk about praying and they're saying, you know, I pray all the time and I'm not getting answers. And somebody inevitably speaks up. Well, sometimes the answer is no. You know what? Sometimes the answer is no, but I also believe that Christ is going to give you the reason why. He's not like us as parents where sometimes we'll look at our children. No, why? Because I said so. That's not Christ. That's not what he's going to do. That's not how he's going to handle what we're asking for. He may still say no, 
But you're going to know why if you just stop and listen to why the answer is no. In Matthew 4, 18 through 20, Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately dropped their nets and followed him. The same Christ, the same Jesus, the same Savior that called these two men, Peter and Andrew, is the same Jesus that is calling you right now. Make no mistake, there is no difference between the Jesus in the Bible and the Jesus who is looking for you and want you to be with him. The Jesus that is in the Bible that created the universe, that created the world, that created everything that we have is also the same Jesus who would like to take a bike ride with you. When I was writing this message, one of the things I was going to do is I was going to name this, and actually I, I had told Shaman, the title of this was supposed to be, It's Okay to Draft Jesus. Now, the meaning that, like when you're riding bikes, you get in behind somebody, you draft behind them, they cut the path. But what I realized is you can't draft somebody if you don't know how to follow them. So before you can draft Jesus, you need to choose Jesus. Before you can get on the bike with him, you need to understand that he's been wanting to be with you the entire time. I right now am at a point in my life um, where I understand more, not everything, and I know I got a ways to go. Please don't, understand, don't misunderstand that. I, I think I got it all nailed down. I don't. But I know enough now to listen. I know enough now to understand that I have the opportunity to stand in front of you and talk about my God because he gave me that opportunity. It was nothing I did. I got out of bed this morning, got in my truck, a truck that he provided for me, put on the clothes that he was able to give me a job to buy, and came to church today safely because of him. When we start understanding that it's all about Jesus, we start understanding that he wants nothing but the best for us, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, your life will be completely and totally different. Take the journey. Jump on the bike. Because I'm telling you right now, if you get on that bike and go for that ride, it is a ride you will never, ever regret. God bless you.